The right to know about chemical hazards on the job and in the community is now a reality. Labor unions with community groups from all across the country have won these important rights, the first step in protection from injury and disease at work. I'm Peg Seminario, Director of Health and Safety Activities here at AFL-CIO headquarters in Washington, D.C. We've put this program together to tell you about your rights under one of the key right to know protections, the OSHA Hazard Communication Standard. This video includes live footage from an AFL-CIO national teleconference on the right to know, where we brought together health and safety experts and local trade unionists from across the country, sharing what they've learned about how right to know really works on the shop floor. During the next half hour, you'll hear a lot about chemical labels and data sheets and training programs, and that's all important. But right to know isn't about forms and procedures. It's really about people's lives. It's too bad that they're having to use people as guinea pigs. That's what I feel. I mean, if, if someone come up and said, okay, you've got a choice. You can work here and not have any children, or you can work somewhere else and, and, and have children. But they didn't give, they didn't give us a choice. And right to know is about management indifference. I had no idea at all that we had any kind of a process here in our plant operations that could do such a thing to a human being. Heck, we just, we just didn't draw the conclusion that there'd be sterility from the fact that the testicles were shriveling up. Now that I'm sterile, that I have an increased uh, chance of cancer, and I've had some damage to my liver, my eyes, and some brain damage. Whether you work on the assembly line or in the secretarial pool, the chances are you have to use chemicals to get your job done. Organized labor's recognition that we can stay healthy and get the job done has moved protection from hazardous chemicals to the top of our agenda. The leadership has come right from the top, from AFL-CIO President Lane Kirkland and from Lynn Williams, President of the United Steelworkers of America and Chairman of the AFL-CIO Standing Committee on Occupational Safety and Health. Contributing to our Right to Know teleconference were six of organized labor's most experienced safety and health experts. We heard from Deborah Berkowitz, Director of Health and Safety for the AFL-CIO's Food and Allied Service Trades Department, Rod Wolford, Director of Safety and Health for the International Brotherhood of Painters and Allied Trades, Michael Wright, Director of Safety and Health for the United Steelworkers of America, Jamie Cohen, an occupational health and safety consultant for the United Paper Workers International Union. Peter Dooley, an industrial hygienist with the United Auto Workers. And Eric Scherzer of Local 8149 of the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union in Rahway, New Jersey. Eric is also vice president of the New Jersey Industrial Union Council. Who gives you the right to know about the chemicals you're working with? Right to know is a federal right under OSHA's hazard communication standard. And in 29 states, it's a state right too. Every employer covered by the law has to put a label on every container of hazardous chemicals. A label telling what's inside, what the risks are, and who made the chemical. For every hazardous chemical your employer uses, they have to have a material safety data sheet. That's MSDS for short. What's the chemical's name? What are its physical properties? Are there safety and health risks if you use it? How can you protect yourself? It's all in the MSDS. If the company assigns you to work with hazardous chemicals, they have to give you training on their time and before you ever touch a chemical. And the employer's got to have a written plan spelling out in detail how it's going to protect you and follow the law. That's what the right to know standard says. But knowledge by itself doesn't equal protection. That's where you come in. You have to be the chemical hazard police, a first line of defense against employer resistance or ignorance. You have to turn the right to know into the right kind of protection. That's your best chance of living in good health long enough to collect your pension. How do you know if you're even covered by federal right to know rules? The first right to know rules OSHA put out covered only workers in manufacturing. So if you work for a manufacturer, cars, steel, clothing, chemicals, paper, anything, then you're definitely covered. But it wasn't fair for OSHA to give right to know only to manufacturing workers. And when organized labor took OSHA to court, a federal judge said it wasn't legal either. 
The details of the final court order were still being hammered out as we were making this video. So if you don't work for a manufacturer, if you have a job in a hospital or an electric company, or you're in transportation or you work construction, you may already have the right to know. If you don't, it's just a matter of time. The first warning that you're working with a hazardous chemical should come from the label. Every container of hazardous chemicals has to have one. It's the chemical company's job to make up the label and put it on the drum before it's shipped. But it's up to every employer who uses a chemical to check for the label when they receive the shipment of chemicals and to make sure that the labels aren't removed or defaced. The label should tell you three things. It has to show the name and address of the company which supplied the chemical. It has to have the chemical's identity, a brand name or chemical name, a code name or code number. Every label has to have an appropriate hazard warning, the physical and health hazards of using the chemical. It's not enough for the label to say just danger or harmful if inhaled. The risk warning has to be specific. The container the chemical is shipped in has to have a label, and so does any container the chemicals put in for storage at the factory. There are only three exceptions to the labeling rule. If the chemical is in a portable container to make it easier to work with, it doesn't have to have a label as long as the only worker who uses it is the one who made the transfer. If the chemical is in a stationary process container, like a dip tank or a reaction vessel, the company doesn't have to put a label on it but they do have to post a sign or a placard with the same kind of information that's on the label. And if chemicals are in the piping system, no label is required. This issue was discussed at our teleconference by Rod Wolford also from the Painters bad, Union. Product identity on labels can be brand names or codes or code numbers. Uh, so when you're looking at a material safety data sheet, you have to make sure to compare the identity on the MSDS with that on the label. They must be the same. For example, if the identity on the label says that it's uh, Dayglow 215, check it on the MSDS, because on the MSDS it must also say Dayglow 215. For the full information the hazard communication standard entitles you to, you have to go beyond the label to the MSDS, the Material Safety Data Sheet. The chemical manufacturer or supplier has to provide the MSDS with the chemical it's making or selling. But if an employer mixes different chemicals together, then it has to make up its own MSDS for the mixture it's created. It has to give the product identity. A brand name or a code name or number is okay, as long as it's the same name or number that's on the label. Now, don't be fooled by chemical family names, such as aromatic hydrocarbons. Sometimes hundreds of chemicals are in a chemical family, and the hazards of its members may vary widely. The chemical identity is also unacceptable if its name describes a chemical function, such as a plasticizer or a surfactant or a biocide. These tell you what the product does, but not what the product is. The MSDS has to list the chemical's hazardous ingredients by their chemical names. That's important because it lets you check the chemical ingredients yourself to find out what the hazards really are. By every hazardous ingredient, the MSDS has to give the maximum safe exposure. If OSHA has set a permissible exposure limit, a PEL, it has to be listed. The MSDS doesn't have to list all the ingredients of the product, just the hazardous ones. And it doesn't have to say what percentage of each hazardous ingredient makes up the chemical. That's too bad, because if you know the percentages, you can figure out if all the ingredients have really been listed. And you have a right to be skeptical if a chemical company or your employer claims that their particular combination of chemicals isn't hazardous, so it doesn't need an MSDS. It is very unlikely that a mixture of chemicals is going to qualify as being, quote, non-hazardous. The definition of what's hazardous is very broad under the standard. We've probably evaluated 100 MSDSs that claim that nothing in the mixture was hazardous. And in most cases, we've been able, by hassling the, the the, uh, the, the supplying company, we've been able to get information on what's in it, and none of those claims have stood up. There's always been one hazardous ingredient in one of those mixtures. Mm -hmm. so, so employers, you know, are in most cases obligated to get that information under the standard, and even if they're not, they can still use the economic power they've got of refusing to buy the product unless they get good information. 
Sometimes this part of the MSDS has the words confidential or proprietary information. That means that the chemical company considers the chemical identity, the exact chemicals that make up the product, a trade secret that they don't want their competitors to get a hold of. The company has to put their trade secret claim on the MSDS. They can't just leave the ingredient section blank or put N.A. Trade secret or not, the chemical company still has to put the chemical characteristics, health effects, safe handling precautions, and protective procedures on the MSDS. Very few commercial chemical formulas are really trade secrets. But some companies make the claim anyway, and they've been doing it for years. Before the hazard communication standard, organized labor fought trade secret claims before the NLRB, just as we now do before OSHA. So you go back to the NLRB cases that Jamie talked about and the, the 3M company, uh, when the OCAW local went and asked the 3M company for the list of chemicals and all the information on the medical results from the exposed workers, the company claimed that every single chemical, I think it, it was hundreds of chemicals, every hundreds. single chemical mm -hmm. was a trade secret and they couldn't reveal the chemical identities. And that was really the beginning of that whole fight to gain access under the NLRB. And, and the NLRB ruled that, in fact, everything couldn't be a trade secret, perhaps some things, but not all things. And now we have an OSHA standard, which, again, limits the number of chemicals that employers can claim trade secret, or at least they're supposed to limit what they claim. It's basically those things that, uh, in fact, aren't known to their competitors, and also those things that can't be figured out through a standard chemical, chemical analysis. If you start seeing too many trade secret claims on MSDSs, get in touch with the chemical companies, either directly or through management, and make them justify their claims. The chemical company has to be prepared to tell doctors or nurses, any exposed worker or a union representative, what's in their chemical, trade secret or not, and right away if it's an emergency. And I think that uh, uh, trying to get manufacturers to release their, in quotes, trade secrets uh, is something that can be done. And you might have to uh, do a few operations to get it done, sign confidentiality agreements and so on and so forth, uh, but those things are uh, well worth it. Unfortunately, the standard does state there are these things called trade secrets, and uh, so consequently we have to live with that, and uh, while they may be a bunch of bull, they're, uh, they're still real. Every MSDS has a section called chemical characteristics. That means what the chemical should look like and how it acts. Is it a powder or a paste, a liquid, an aerosol? Make sure the description matches the appearance of the chemicals you're using. The MSDS will describe the chemical's odor, too. The smell of a chemical can help you identify it, but don't count on it. Some hazardous chemicals don't have any noticeable smell at all. And after you've worked with the chemical for a while, you may get so used to its smell that you don't notice it. Some chemicals have vapors that are invisible and have no smell at all. If you depended on sight and smell, you could walk into a room full of dangerous fumes without knowing it. So check the boiling point the vapor pressure, and the vapor density. They'll tell you what the risk is of inhaling dangerous vapors the chemical's giving off. The MSDS section on fire and explosion data gives you the flashpoint of the chemical, how hot the chemical has to get before it burns. Another section of the MSDS gives you what's called reactivity data. Can it break down or react if it comes in contact with other substances? This is especially important if a chemical touches heated surfaces or is mixed with another chemical. If any of the chemicals listed in the hazardous ingredients section can affect your health, the MSDS has to list every adverse health effect of the product or its ingredients, short term or long term. An acute effect means something that happens immediately after you've been exposed, like a skin rash, dizziness or lightheadedness. A chronic effect is a health condition that has developed gradually, maybe with no symptoms for years, and is very hard to cure, like asbestosis or brown lung disease from breathing cotton dust. A chemical can cause both acute and chronic effects, depending upon how you come into contact with it. It can cause problems with your skin or eyes, can affect your breathing, can cause allergies, cancer, or it can injure your reproductive system or your liver or kidneys. If it has any of these effects, the MSDS is supposed to tell you so. But what's supposed to be on the MSDS isn't always what you'll get. We just completed a survey of material safety data sheets, as I was saying before, comparing the typical material safety data sheet that our local receives with the hazard communication substance fact sheets that the New Jersey Department of Health has done. 
And the discrepancies we found are just remarkable. We did a, the survey showed that on health effects, just on health effects alone, which are, yeah, as you know, one of the most crucial aspects of those forms, about 90% of the acute or short-term uh, health effects were correctly reported on the material safety data sheets. But when you get to chronic effects, long-term effects, mm -hmm. it's exactly what we'd expect. Only 25% of those company-supplied MSDSs had the correct information compared to the New Jersey fact sheets. The gaps are tremendous. The MSDS also has to tell you how the chemical gets into your body, what the symptoms of exposure are, in other words, how you know if you've been exposed, what illnesses can be made worse by exposure to the chemical, what's the best emergency first aid treatment. In addition to telling you what can go wrong when you're working with hazardous chemicals, the MSDS also gives you an idea of how to prevent hazards and what to do when things do go wrong. It's not enough to just say, avoid breathing gases or vapors, but that's all a lot of MSDSs have. Instructions for protection, either to prevent exposure or after you've been exposed, have to be specific. A good MSDS in the section called Precautions for Safe Handling and Use will tell you the safest way to handle or store the chemical, what to do if the chemical is released or spilled, and how to dispose of waste material, as well as what kind of emergency respirators to have on hand and even what to do if an evacuation becomes necessary. If you work with hazardous chemicals, risks are a fact of life, but the control measures section of the MSDS will give you ways to keep those risks as small as possible. A respirator can help if it's the right kind and you follow OSHA procedures for taking care of it, but many respirators don't provide long-term protection. And good local exhaust ventilation Pulling fumes away from the worker is important, too. Personal protective equipment's important, but don't bet your life on it. When all is said and done, no amount of protection can beat eliminating exposure at the source. The best MSDS ever put together won't do a thing for you unless you can get a look at it. If you work with chemicals, you've got a legal right under the hazard communication standard to see the MSDS right away without leaving the workstation. Union representatives also have a right to see any MSDS on request. I think it's yeah. real important for local unions to be checking the dates when the MSDSs have been prepared. Mm -hmm. That's right, and look at November 25th, 1983 for when the standard was issued, first of all, so that 1983 date, and 1985 for when the standard went into effect, because anything that's earlier than 1983 is really going to be totally out of sync with the standards right. requirements, so I think people really yeah. need to kind of put that date, uh, jot that down, and when they look at data sheets, uh, keep that keep that somewhat in mind. What happens if an MSDS is out of date or just plain wrong? Once an MSDS has been shown to be inaccurate, the employer is responsible for obtaining a new one from the chemical manufacturer or supplier. If your workplace uses a large number of chemical products, you will have to establish some priorities for evaluating the MSDSs. Start with products used in the greatest quantities or those which pose the greatest risks. For example, if workers have complained about health problems caused by a particular chemical product, that MSDS should be evaluated immediately. If an MSDS is missing or inaccurate, the union has several options. First, request the employer to obtain an accurate MSDS from the chemical supplier. Second, the union can contact the chemical supplier directly and request the MSDS. Third, you can file a complaint with OSHA or your own state federal agency and request an inspection of the workplace. Working with hazardous chemicals is too risky to pick up just from looking at a label or even reading an MSDS. So employers have to provide training on company time for workers on how to work with hazardous chemicals. What's in this training? One thing's for sure. The hazard communication standard says it's more than management just giving its workers MSDSs to read. First, the trainer has to make sure everyone understands the requirements of the hazard communication standard. Everyone also has to learn the physical and health risks they're taking with the chemicals they work with. Training has to show how to detect whether hazardous chemicals are present and the rule of thumb tests any worker can use. Chemical labels and MSDSs can be technical, so the law says that your training has to teach you how to read these documents and how to understand them. You have to get training on protecting yourself from chemicals, ventilation, work practices, emergency procedures, 
and protective gear. Training can't work without you getting involved. No one knows your job better than you. So make sure that what the trainer says in the classroom squares with real life on the shop floor. Because one thing you have to remember, this training is a one-shot deal. In other words, you only get trained once in the chemicals you work with. And if that training is terrible and it doesn't provide workers any information on the kinds of chemicals they work with or how they're to judge whether they're protected or not, then we've sort of lost it. And, it, and this is a very important part of the standard because employers really have to be very truthful. Employers, by and large, will not provide effective chemical-specific training because an effective training program will raise workers' demands that an employer clean up the shop. After a truly effective training program, workers should ask, why isn't my employer reducing the hazards? In one instance, we had a local union that requested a copy of the company's written hazard communication program and felt that after reviewing it that the training program was totally inadequate, that it didn't meet any of the needs of the local union out on the shop floor, that it didn't address any of the specific chemical exposures. All it contained was like a 15-minute generic videotape. And the local union rejected it and said that we won't have this out on the floor and we want you to give us something better that's specific. And the company kept coming back and bringing a new program. The union rejected it like three or four more times till they finally got the kind of program they wanted that was going to be meaningful to their members. Getting the federal government to recognize and to protect your right to know about the chemicals you work with isn't the end of the fight. It's just the beginning. The chemical names and technical terms on labels and data sheets may look complicated and confusing. But you don't need a PhD to understand your right to know any more than you need a PhD to work with chemicals on your job. The right to know only requires employers to give out information. It doesn't require them to actually reduce or control exposures to any chemical at all. So you have to follow up to turn right to know into real protection. As Eric Scherzer from the OCAW said at our teleconference, Winning the right to know in a shop must be immediately followed with action to reduce exposure to the most hazardous chemicals. Otherwise, right to know is just right to know what's killing us. Right to know must be part of a campaign to reduce exposures or it's a meaningless right. Here's what you can do. Monitor your employer on your own or through your union to make sure that right to know laws are being followed. Inform fellow workers about their rights under the law. Tell them how to get answers to their questions about chemical hazards. Get real protection into the contract. Why can't management buy safer chemicals with good MSDSs and no trade secret claims? The hazard communication standards just the beginning of your protection against hazardous chemicals. Build on it by beefing up protections in your contract and by using your safety and health committee to enforce those protections. The right to know law is a tremendous tool for increased union participation in health and safety. Although the federal and state laws set minimum requirements, these can be improved or incorporated into contractual language. This may be especially important since different interpretations of the law can affect the implementation of effective right to know programs. New contract language can be negotiated to clarify areas of dispute. Just getting the information is really the first step. And the process of building the committee and getting the information and building the committee is one that, that leads us towards correcting the problems. That's because, right. you know, the, getting the information is the easiest part. The real bottom line on some of this stuff, from my, from my viewpoint, is are our actions here building the local health and safety committees? I mean, all of this stuff relies on a strong in-plan committee backed by a local union, backed by an international union. I mean, if without that, if, if any of these tactics, if the tools that we use, the OSHA has a communication standard, don't end up building those local committees, then somewhere along the line where we're going to, the process is going to fall apart. When problems with hazardous chemicals can't be solved through the Safety and Health Committee or the grievance procedure, it's time to call OSHA. Ask for an implant investigation and citations for documented violations. The only threat that the company has to tell the truth is essentially the threat that you'll find out that they're not telling the truth and that you might call OSHA in. And as you know, the companies fight OSHA and we all malign it. They hate OSHA inspections. We're seeing a fair number of citations. You have to remember, first of all, that all these citations are, uh, have no, most of them have no 
penalties attached to them whatsoever. It's a wrist slapping kind of thing. But it does begin, you know, some of the employers who didn't begin the process when they first started, when they should have, or when 86, when they were supposed to have finished, do begin when they, when they finally get cited by OSHA. So it is, it is a process that's, that's beginning, and it, it provides some sort of function, and it's a threat. I mean, we, employers don't like to have OSHA come in there, don't like to be found in the wrong, don't like to be found violating the law, and uh, they know that they are. And so again, I guess just to make the point, uh, as strongly as we can, that don't give up. In fact, it's going to be those efforts of pushing forward, challenging, establishing new territory in this area where we're going to get chemicals identified, chemicals covered, and, and the hazards fully represented. It, it, What's the bottom line? Before, but now what can you do when the boss wants you to do a job that's not safe? That's things. downright dangerous. Is there a right to refuse? And some unions have negotiated that kind of language, and there are examples of that kind of language being incorporated into the law, where if you believe that that job is unsafe, you have the right to refuse to do it. But uh, you should know that if you use that right, it, you have to follow certain procedures to, to make your case uh, as good as possible. Uh, it is important to recognize that if someone exercises uh, a right to refuse to do a job, that they should get their union representative on, the, on that situation immediately. They should clearly state that I'm not doing this job because it's a, a safety hazard. And they should offer to do other work uh, in the workplace uh, that would take them away from that situation. Right to know is the law now. But if your boss is one of those who hasn't gotten the message, you're not alone. There are lots of employers out there who are perfectly comfortable with sliding by. And as we know with cutbacks in OSHA, they're, they're out there, but they're not really out there. And there are a lot of employers who are going to continue to slide by until locals aggressively and, and forcefully push on these issues. Right. Employers can no longer hide behind the fact of, oh, everything is safe in the plant, or I have no idea what you're working with. They have to actually give workers information, arm them with information that they can use to protect themselves. In closing, I'd like to point out the message on my button, which is, right to know, use it or lose it. And I think that says it right there. Right to know is the first step in protecting workers and the community from unnecessary exposures to hazardous chemicals. It's a right the labor movement won through job actions, grievances, testifying, political pressure, and uniting with our friends in the community. This videotape is part of a whole campaign to get the word out about the right to know through educational programs, television, and radio. What we start here, in the interest of our members, can pave the way for future gains to protect our safety, health, and environment. If you need more information about the right to know or want copies of this videotape, call us in Washington or contact your international union. We've won the right to know. Now let's make it work. As a result of the labor movement's efforts, on August 19, 1987, OSHA expanded the hazard communication standard to cover all workers under the agency's jurisdiction. The action came in response to a court order. Employers must be in compliance by May 1988. Workers not covered by OSHA, like state and local public employees, will continue to be covered by state right-to-know laws.